Why it's nice. It reminded me of a basketball game that I was at not too long ago. I, I looked down, and many of you know Colonel Jason Duvall, and, and I look over, and he, he used to go to church with me, and we, we still see each other at the basketball games. So I go over, and I sit down beside him, and I say, how's everything going? He goes, oh, pretty good, pretty good. My son loves me. My, my daughter right there, I don't know what, what goes on with her. He said, sometimes she loves me, sometimes she hates me. He said, she's smiling right now. No, no, she's crying. <laughs> it's just that range of emotions that a teenager is going through. So uh, I absolutely understand that. And, and I think sometimes we think that we outgrow that. We think, oh, I've got a good handle on this. But then the phone calls come in, or this happens, or that happens. And we go through those range of emotions. I was able to experience that. Many of you in the, the bug yesterday morning got to hear me say that I, I did my, my nephew's wedding last night. And uh, we planned for it all afternoon. And we got into the early evening, and that's when we had the wedding. You get everybody together and you see a range of emotions. By the time that the wedding started, his bride was, do I smile? Do I not smile? What do I do? Someone's late. I said, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. At the end of the day, if you two were there and I'm there, we're good. And there were actually four ministers taking part in the wedding. And so I said, if one of the four of us show up, you, you've only got to be at 25%. And this thing is going to happen. She's just so nervous the whole day. But watching that range of emotions that individuals go through, it's amazing. I was studying, I was reading this week, and one of the books that was on my shelf, and I've always, I was like picking it up and looking at it, but it came from Andy Stanley. And it was called It Came From Within. And this, this stories that he put together, and that Andy put together, talked about the heart issues. And a few of those things really stuck out to me. Why, why do we do what we do? Why do we think how we think? And not only that, but when we put our thinking and our feelings into motions, into actions, and actually start to walk it out. What does that begin to look like? In fact, I was thinking about this. Uh, anybody in this room, you've ever been in total darkness and you realize what a precious gift a, a flashlight is? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, in fact, I was at a scout camp with my son one time, and I, I was just praying for the Cluck family because Brenda was there by herself with two young ones, and they were just running literally in circles around her, I think. Uh, but I was over there with my son. I'm going, okay, just hold still or I will tie you to a tree. Well, that night, it, it the temperatures dropped. It got cold. But thankfully, the Army, in its infinite wisdom, gave me a fantastic sleeping bag. And I took that and I said, son, if you need the sleeping bag here, I've got, I've got another good one. But all the lights went out. The, the campfire dies down. It gets quiet out there. It gets silent. All that you can hear is the wind. And then my son goes, Dad, I don't have a nightlight. It's like, son, there's no electricity. What do you want? And he goes, I need a nightlight. I said, hang on a second. So I started digging. I opened my flashlight. Looked at him. He said, just leave that on. So I'm not going to run my battery down. And I thought, well, I will run this one down. That's okay. I'll, I'll just recharge it. So I turned it on. I sit in the middle of the tent. And he said, oh, I can sleep now. But just having that light in the middle of the night, it helped to, to dispel that darkness. And we all understand that analogy. But uh, what someone in another campsite found out was that if you, have a light, it also helps to scatter the critters because someone heard something in the middle of the night and flipped on their light and realized that there was a, uh, a raccoon sitting there nibbling on some of their snacks that they forgot to tie at the time. And so there was a couple of loud screams. I don't know if that had any, anything to do with the Cluck family or not, but, but I'm assuming that since I haven't heard that funny story that it didn't come from her and that they, the, the, uh, the critters were scattered into the other camps from other people. But my son, he experienced that fear of the darkness. <coughs> And whenever I look at this fear, when it's exposed to light, the same thing is true about sin when <clears throat> confession comes in. See, confession exposes our secrets and it frees our hearts from the oppressive power of guilt. We, gotta, we have to understand that today we're talking about the memory that wouldn't die. And I want you to think about this, that lurking within our hearts are those ideas, those sins, the guilty feelings that we don't want to mention or turn over to anyone. And so we hold on. In fact, whenever I was, was studying about this, one of the things that jumped out at me was, was this simple statement. That confession exposes our secrets and it frees our hearts from the oppressive power of guilt. Think about that, the oppressive power. It's literally it's the, the chains of guilt. Have you ever really felt guilty over something? Think about that. I want us to kind of camp here to expose our hearts to those memories, thoughts, and actions that, that cause us to wonder this question, will I ever get past this? I was 
talking to a soldier not too long ago, and that was their, their comment. I keep doing this thing, and I can't get past this thing. It's, it's like a, it, it's actually, it's worse than a level on some little, I, I, some little application that you have on your phone when you're killing time, those little time killing devices, and you can't get past this question, or you can't get past this level. I watch my son get so frustrated sometimes. Dad, I can't, I can't get past this level on whatever game he's playing. And he's so frustrated. We do the same thing in our lives. We have something that we can't get past. Why do we do this thing? Why do we continue to spin our wheels, if you will? Um, for example, how many of you have repetitive arguments in your marriage? Anybody? We always go through this. We always talk about this. But I mean, I'm thinking we've got one truthful guy in the entire audience here, right there. Good. All right. So the rest of you know that. The rest of you that guilty feeling. You're right. We're tracking now. Okay. So I want to define my terms here. What I'm not talking about is the confession on simple admission of an incident. Yes, I drank the last of the milk, honey. Yes, I, I sped through that light, officer. I, I'm so sorry about that. <clears throat> now, why am I not talking? That is a confession. But why am I not talking about that type of confession? Here's why. This confession eases our conscience, and it actually temporarily does nothing to expose the deeper secrets that we carry. You drank the last of the milk because you're selfish, and you wanted it all to yourself. You sped through the red light because you are impatient. It doesn't do anything to eliminate or expose those deeper truths. What the problem was, uh, you, you felt like that idiot that was in front of you that you just had to zoom past because he doesn't know how to drive and should never have been given a license. Well, you know, that's, that's the state of Arkansas's fault for giving that guy a license and, and making that light not stay green longer. Yes, officer, I ran through it. I confess, therefore I'm good. What tends to happen is this. We read 1 John 1.19. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now this is a, a pretty good statement, right? It can be dangerous in the hand of a child because a child could read this or, or someone who, who doesn't really want to press into the biblical understanding could read this and go, okay, so if I confess my sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive that sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So let's let's take, for example, I know I know someone in here who has some, some very interesting sons. So let's take Carl Shulka, for example. Okay? So we he loves his sons, but let's take let's take them for as an example. I, I, now none of this is true. I just want to use him, him as an example because he won't mind at all. Let's say that he read this verse to his sons, and one of them, one of them gets this and goes, okay. I've been struggling. 16 year old? Alright, so the 16 year old's been struggling. He's starting to come of age. He goes, well, you know, maybe, maybe I've got some temptations. Maybe I'm thinking about some girls. Maybe I'm thinking about this or that. Maybe, maybe I didn't study for my test, so maybe you know, I cheated a little bit. And they're just the general temptations of life. So he starts off small. And as he grows up, as he's 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, he just commits a little sin here. I lied about something. I took something that wasn't mine. I punched my brother and blamed it on my other brother. And, and, and he lies about it. And then he goes before his bed at night and bows down and he prays. And he goes, God, I want to give you a detailed list so that you will cleanse me because I know the loophole. So you kind of cleanse me, God, of all unrighteousness. I can believe completely washed up good because that's what it says right here. So I'm confessing. See, the problem is this. What can happen is a dangerous trend. That when tempted, we can begin to think and to start going through this little game of if I confess to God, then He'll always forgive me. Eventually, the confession becomes nothing more than guilt relief. I feel bad because of what I've just done. What if, what if a simple lie about a husband you know, and his wife driving and it's some pretty girl passes and the husband just kind of does a double take because he's a human being and he just kind of looks and she said, what, were you just looking at that girl? No, not me. I was, I, I was making sure that wasn't a car driving through there. But I'm, no, I'm good. A little lot. God, I'm so sorry about that. I just lied to my wife. But he says it in his heart. He doesn't mention it out loud. And a little bit later, he's in Walmart and his wife is over in another aisle and he's pushing the cart and here she comes. That, that pretty girl and she's walking down his aisle. So now he gets to glare just a little bit longer. And now that blonde hair and those long legs, now he begins to think about that. And so back, back at home, wife goes to bed just a little bit early, and he decides, it's no harm. I'm just going to turn on the computer and see what happens when I type in Google. 
And he goes from website to website to website. And then he goes, yeah, I feel guilty about this. I'll pray. And I'll go to God. You see this game that we begin to play? It's almost like we do it from a young age. In fact, in some of us, it's become intrinsic. See, chances are that we all play this sort of game. I understand that some of us in here may say, well, I don't do that. <coughs> go to a priest. And I pray to him. I tell, I tell him, he tells me my sin. And the other person goes, well, that's crazy. I just go to God and tell him. But what we've done is we've done everything in private. Everything we've done in private. We've quietly walked in. I want you to think about this little parable, if you will. There were two brothers. Two wonderful brothers. Loved each other very much, but one of them had a bad problem. He always took things from his other brother. Always stole. In fact, he would never try to return those items until he was confronted. So the, the older brother would walk in and he would say, where's my new shirt? I just bought a new shirt. And he would look up and the younger brother's wearing it as he walks out the door. Hey, 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 you took my shirt. I, I want to wear that. That's my new one. Oh, oh, this? So sorry. I, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I did not mean to take your new shirt. Where is my... And just name the list. Where is this? Where is that? And he begins. And every time that this younger brother takes something from the older brother, he comes in afterwards. Every night at the end of the night, he sits down on the edge of the bed. I am so sorry. My apologies. I will, I will not do that again. And as he's doing that, he's, he's just slowly, I, I will not do that again. And he's, what are you putting in your pocket? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing. I'm not putting anything in my pocket. You're taking something from me right now while you're apologizing. And the younger brother walks out with whatever else he'd just taken. Or in five minutes he comes back into the room and he takes something else. I don't even need to make the application here. We have to understand that even if the younger one, or the older one, excuse me, was truly able to forgive his younger brother at this time, what would eventually happen to this relationship? Eventually that older brother is just going to crack and go... You're not even sorry. You're telling me you're sorry. You're saying you're sorry. You, you, you have the words that may be coming out of your mouth. Sometimes you're pretending to even be sorry. You're just going through the motions. I hear you mumbling to yourself that you're sorry. But then you're doing these things again. And the younger brother says, but I'm confessing. I'm confessing. So that was my confession to you. I confess my sin that you need to be just and right and forgive me. You see, we must face the fact that our approach to confession is actually known as insult to God our Father because of how it normally plays itself out. Normally it's quiet. Normally it's driving into work. When it finally gets verbalized, God, I did this. And it's eating me alive with guilt. And we're only going before God because if we really truly ask ourselves what lurks in our heart, it's this. I want to get rid of this guilty feeling don't want to feel this way anymore. Not, I am broken because of my sin. Not, I am sorry for which direction I have gone. God, I have broken this relationship and I have walked away from you. None of that. It's, I don't want to feel bad. I want to be absolved of this so that I can feel better. If we begin to really rationalize it. So, so somewhere we were taught that confession's purpose was conscious, conscious relief. And here's why. The English definition of the word conscience or confess is this. It's to admit. It's to admit to. But Scripture says something completely different. Scripture says it's associated with change. And I want to take you to two Scriptures that show that. These two Scriptures tie confession. Confession of sin with two other things. Restoration and repentance. And in fact, it's a picture of if I had a dirt road right here. And I'm walking down the dirt road, and I come to a, a Y, and I go, okay, I'm going right. And I begin walking down that dirt road, and I stop, and I go, this is not the right direction. How many times have you been doing land nav, and you start going, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm off. Do you continue on? You do a quick asthma check, you realize you're going the wrong direction, you spin it around, you turn <coughs> around, go back where you were supposed to come, and get reestablished. And, and what tends to happen is this. Confession is... As if we were walking, realizing we're on the wrong direction, going the wrong direction. We stop and go, hmm, I'm going the wrong direction. I shouldn't do this anymore. And then keep walking. Restoration and repentance is a complete turning from that. In fact, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, talk about John the Baptist. And here's what it says. 
It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all of the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This is incredible because it shows that people were confessing not in solitude and silence that we so often do. Now, I'm going to speak. I know we have a lot of ladies in here, but I'm going to speak a lot to the men. It looks from the marks of it statistically this side of the room. Here we go. What happened with that? They've got a couple of guys over here. Oh, my goodness. All right. So, guys, why do we do this so often? I'm good. I'm just going to take care of it by myself. I got this. I'll be quiet. In silence and in solitude, I'll deal with it. We don't have to tell another soul. I've got it. But here, John the Baptist is there. He's proclaiming repentance. He's saying, turn from your sins. And they're not simply coming down to the water and going, well, I believe I want to be baptized. Here's my sins. Or I took care of that in private on the riverbank. They are simply walking forward and they're going, I was lying. I was cheating. I was sleeping around. I was an adulterer. I was an extortionist. I, I had done all of these things. I was bitter against this person or that person. This memory that I continue to carry with me all of the time in my heart. Because Scripture doesn't talk about the thoughts of our minds. It talks about our hearts. It says the thoughts of your heart. Your emotions guide you. And, and so the, the, the people that you have ignored all of your life, these, these, these individuals that you have hated for so long, that you can't even remember why you hate them. We've all got those. Why are you mad? I don't even know. I just know that I don't like you for some reason. We've all got those people. And it's stupid. It's wrong. And here's, here's what they've got. John the Baptist, is, he's literally dunking them. And he's, they, before they come down the river, they're going, this is what I've done. They're proclaiming. They're confessing. Not in silence. Not in solitude. The confession wasn't a step towards feeling better. It was a step towards abandoning sin. That's the goal. We don't feel better. We kill the sin and we walk away from it. We abandon it. We cut it off. Matthew actually tells us this. In Matthew chapter 5. Just a, a few chapters to the left. Matthew chapter 5 verses 23 and 24 say these words. These are words from Jesus talking on anger. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before you go to the altar. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer the gift. Think about the hearers of that. They're standing at the temple, pigeon in hand, goat in arms, ready to give their sacrifice. And Jesus has just told them, if you get there to that point and you realize, wait a minute, I've just been quietly in silence and solitude confessing my sins to God, hoping to deal with it. I need to tie this sheep up. I need to hand this pigeon off. And I need to go and confess out loud to my brother what is going on. I need to, I need to abandon this vain pursuit of going through the motions with God and actually deal with with the people that God has put in front of me. Do you think that those openly confessing are more apt to never walk in that again? That sin or that hatred or that anger again? I think so. I think they absolutely would. So, so in closing, I'll simply say this. That God, in effect, here is saying that relationships with Him hinge on our relationships with other people. The two are absolutely inseparable. That you cannot have fellowship with the Father without... Fellowship with others. So let me kind of bring this full circle that our memories, our addictions, our sin has a cycle to it. Have you ever noticed that? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, I'm falling into this temptation. I'm sinning, I'm sinning, I'm sinning. Oh, this is a depression. I feel guilty, I feel guilty. And it's right there. It's so many times we've trained ourselves to go, in my sin, I've hurt someone or I've been hurt by someone holding something against someone or, or I know that I'm, I'm ignoring someone because I don't want to have that awkward conversation. It's a cycle. And that the only way to actually enter in and break that cycle, because when we begin to feel the guilt, we've trained ourselves, well, if I just simply say it to God and me quietly, we dealt with it. 
all is forgiven. Do I believe we have a God who forgives us? Absolutely. Do I believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that He comes to us and He loves us? And there's so many times someone may not be able to just openly confess, yes. But I want to say this. If you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to stop in your heart of hearts having that memory, that thing that continues to drive you nuts day in and day out, or in that cycle, when it comes up, you just know that gut feeling that rises up inside of you. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to talk about it. I thought I did deal with this. I thought I, I, thought I put that to death. Well, what did you do? I quietly, in silence and in solitude, talked about it to God. But did you do it to make your guilt feeling go away? Or did you invite God to come in and break this cycle of sin and guilt through God-designed confession? Which means I'm now not stepping away from guilt. I'm stepping away from sin to abandon it. I am turning from the path that I am on. Repentance is this. I, I, I'm giving up all other choices. I'm following the path that Christ has laid out for me. I'm confessing and acknowledging that I am on the wrong path. So that doesn't mean that I go, I'm sorry, forgiven, great, I will continue down my path. Wrong route. About face. Move out in the other direction. Move out in the direction that you know is the one that God is calling you to. When we see these words, that if we confess our sins, I want you to look at it in a new light. John 1, 1 through 1, John 1. Excuse me, 1 John 1 9 says this. If we confess our sins, not the Alcoholics Anonymous High, I'm so to say, but, but in a sense, that as a husband, that I sit down with my wife and I say, honey, here's where I have been busy. Here's where I have not had time for you and the kids. When the kids are going crazy, and I go, I had a rough day at work this last week. It's her job to deal with it. I abandoned you. I, I went into the I went into the bathroom and, and just piddled around in there cleaning stuff while the kids just went ahead and had their fits. This, this is real life for Chapel Hill. Four rugrats running around. You don't think that they go crazy sometimes? You don't think that I have hard days and I go, I come home and I just say, I just really want everything to be quiet. Just just silence. Oh, wait, I forgot I volunteered for these 10 million things because I can't say no to people. And I've got to do this and this and this. And so, honey, I'm sorry that I'm burnt out. Is that better than simply going, I am burnt out and I'm, I'm sitting in my car going, I am tired. How am I going to I'll just, I'll suck it up and I'll just continue. How is that going to make anything better? In silence and in solitude? Or open confession. Because if I in the right relationship that God has put before me in the relationship with my wife can confess that, then I can openly and admittingly confess to God and He will be just and forgive me. And it's not a loophole that we find with God. You see, it tells us even within the third commandment not to use His name in vain because He will not hold Him guiltless who does. We cannot think and assume with God that, we, well, we found a loophole here, so I'll just pray this little thing and He forgives me. It's not a loophole. That's using God's name in vain. Misapplying God's name. We cannot go there with God. So I want us to remember confession is not. Admission, I've done it. Silent. Go ahead. Let's just move on with life. God created God, inspired God, motivated confession is linked so much with repentance and full restoration. Abandoning of sin, moving in a new direction. If you'd like to know more about that, talk to me. I know we've all got busy jobs and busy things as we close, but I want you to remember this. I'm always here to talk to you about this. I'm always here to, to kind of give you that, that leaning and just pray with you and say, listen, you want to come and you want to talk, talk to me. And I'll help you to talk to others. Let's get this thing out in the open. Because that's the only way we're going to heal from that. That's the only way we're going to move from there. Let's bow and let's pray. Father God, I come to you today and I want to close in prayer with all of us coming before you to confess what we have done. 
that I take this time and just thank you in my life for, for what you have done. When I have been too busy, when I have been short, not focused on what I need to be focused on, all in the name of a, of a mission that is well and good intention. But God, what I've done is I have forsaken you. And God, I'm sorry for that. And in this room, I, I know that there are so many others in so many different ways that God, there are things that they are dealing with. But God, instead of us coming to you like we've always done, and that's confess to you to feel better about who we are. God, help us to understand that we are insulting you at best. When in the very breath that we say we are sorry, we are planning future sin. Because we are not truly coming to you to abandon sin to not feel bad about it. And God, I pray today that those among us can begin to see that, realize that, spot it in their own life. That they have brothers and sisters in Christ who they can openly confess to and see a restoration of the relationship with you. And I pray this, Lord Jesus, in your most beautiful name.